Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Bible Catholic channel here on YouTube. My name is William Hemsworth, and thank you for joining me for this live show with our special guest. Um, always a pleasure to talk with Bill Snyder. Bill is the founder of Patchwork Heart Ministry, and they just released a fabulous new book, The Hearts Are Burning Within Us. Uh, Bill, how are you doing today? William, it's awesome to be with you as well, man. Thank you so much. It's, I'm doing great. Oh, thank you. And for our audience, if you hear, if you've see any freezes or anything please forgive us i had some bad storms last night so we're gonna do the best we can here all right but bill before we get to the book congratulations again on it can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and maybe how patrick hart started yeah so quickly patrick hart ministry started uh, really in 2012 when i was at a youth conference uh, and the holy spirit said bill start a ministry and i was like uh i'm not really qualified i'm just a little humble youth minister and he uh, really encouraged me throughout the course of that day just kept prodding me and prodding me to start this ministry i had no idea what i was doing uh but he gave me the name patchwork heart because i said if you give me a name i'll start the ministry uh and so that's how it came to be it was blogging and podcasting and all kinds of things for many uh, years uh, and then most recently in 2018, what ended up happening was uh, we found it as a nonprofit and, and made things a little bit more formal. Uh, and and since then, I've kind of taken over, uh, you know, full time in the ministry and working uh, to really build the kingdom of God and, you know, author books and blog and do radio shows and TV shows like this one and, and really spread the gospel. Uh, so it's great to be with you. And and that's, you know, really what our mission is to sow hope into broken hearts uh, and reach into those young souls. Uh, I like to think of ourselves as divine physician assistants, uh, just kind of pointing people toward the way of Jesus who can heal uh, those broken hearts and then empower those people to go out and live the Catholic faith uh, boldly and, and then become divine physician assistants themselves. Okay. Can you tell the audience a little bit about the productions that you all do on a weekly basis? And maybe where they can find those. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can head over to our uh, YouTube channel, Patchwork Heart. Uh, if you just search Patchwork Heart Ministry on uh, YouTube, you will find us. And we have a lot of different uh, programs on there each and every week. Uh, twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, myself and Ann DeSantis host a podcast called Sewing Hope, uh, which is live on YouTube. Uh, many times it's live, uh, but it's always at six o'clock p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays Eastern time. And then um, we also have Young Catholics Respond. I'm on a little bit of a hiatus right now because uh, I was just uh, blessed with a baby boy. Uh, so taking a little bit of a hiatus, uh, you know, to kind of settle into being a parent. But um, that will be back uh, hopefully in the fall and, you know, with new guests and, and new stuff. So uh, check out our Podbean channel, uh, which is a simply patchworkheart.podbean.com. Um, and you can find all our shows and podcasts and whatnot. So, uh, we're, we're super excited about that. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll give a quick plug to, uh, Ann DeSantis as well for her show journeys in faith, uh, which is on our network as well. And that will uh, return in the fall too. So check out our YouTube and check out, uh, podbean.com. Great. Yeah, a lot of great stuff there, and congratulations again on being a father. I had the privilege of meeting the little guy a few moments ago before we went live, so that's always a great thing. So, yeah, congratulations again. I know it's hard work, but it's the best job ever. So <laughs> It's awesome. It is hard work, but it's beautiful, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. So tell us a little bit about your book. I guess, how, how did it get started? Because that's a fascinating story in and of itself. Yeah, so actually, you know, really shortly after Patrick Hart Ministry was conceived in 2012, I think it was like 2013, I, I sat down at my computer, uh, you know, still at my first job as a youth minister, and I wrote this introduction to the book. And it just sat there from 2012 until now. Uh, and I had, I had written it, I had thought, oh, man, it would be really cool one day to be able to take some of these high school seniors that I'm working with and these college freshmen that I'm working with and really talk to them about the questions they have on their heart. And uh, so after I wrote the introduction, though, nothing really materialized. It was always either a conflict of interest or it was just too hard to get started uh, with, with a group of kids. And so it just happened one afternoon that I was with uh, Anne DeSantis after one of our <laughs> TV shows or podcasts or whatever it was. And I said, hey, you know, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and things have kind of slowed down. Uh, I have this introduction to a book that I wrote many years ago. Do you want to take a look at it and just see what 
you think of it and just let me know. And so she looked at this and uh, she was like immediately, oh, I know how I can do this. I'm, I know the people. We can get this done. We can get this started next week. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, so she put us in touch with Mag, Maggie Ringens and Jen Southerton, our two other authors for the book, and a bunch of students. And, and then they pulled a bunch of students from the universities that they work at. Uh, so uh, Maggie Riggins at the time was working at DeSales University and uh, and then uh, Jennifer Southerton's out at Lord's University. And so they gathered a few of their students and uh, Anne is well connected with Gwen and Mercy uh, because both of her or both of her daughters have gone there. And so uh, they uh, she, she pulled students from there, her, her daughter, and we just came together. We had five students from these three, three different universities, and we talked about the questions that were on their heart. Uh, you know, I, I told them straight up, I said, there is no question that you cannot uh, ask. Um, there's nothing off limits, whatever, whatever is on your heart, whatever burns on your heart. And th I think the interesting thing too, was when we were discussing this as authors, we had, you know, a pre-author meeting. I said, you know, can we choose students that are, you know, involved and really involved? And can we choose a few that maybe are on the fringes of involvement so that we get a wide range of spirituality within the uh, within the group? And even though we only had five, I think it was a perfect size because I, once you expand beyond that, I think there's too many voices. So mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is when we met each and every week, we met each and every week with them. And we kept coming back and saying, okay, do you have a question based on this question? Because what ended up happening is we put this Google doc together. So we were like, all right, here's this question on this. And then a student would go, well, I got a question about that based on this response. And so it just kind of flowed into 42 different questions um, that, that the students really had on their heart. And what I really liked about it, William, was the fact that we... Um, the fact that we really took the time to to walk with them through this. It wasn't just like, okay, here are your questions and we're going to write this book and that's going to be it. You know, it was, mm -hmm. no, I, I want to do the ministry aspect of this as we're walking with you through, through this entire experience. So, so they felt loved when we, we prayed together every single week. Uh, we, we always went around and said, uh, what are the intentions that are on your heart too? So, you know, we were praying for people's grandmothers and, and uh, all kinds of stuff. And it was wonderful to be able to encounter that, uh, in a, in a, you know, virtual setting through zoom during a pandemic, but it was, uh, it was beautiful. Uh, and I think, all of us left just surprised by Jesus. I mean, I think that's the best uh, way to way to leave it, you know? Right. Now, these college students, were these questions that they had or were they ones asked to them by their peers as well? You know, I think it's a mix. I think you hear a lot of stuff because they're talking in their own campus ministry programs about about this. Uh, and then there's also the questions that burn on their heart. But if you're if you're actively involved and you're out there witnessing on your college campus, of course, you're encountering questions. And then they brought those into the book. Uh, but I think there were also quite a few that were, you know, especially those students that were still in that, you know, seeking stage. They they, they brought the questions that were on their own heart about things. And, you know, they were you know, they were pretty real questions. I mean, these were, you know, from, from the, from their guts, I like to say they're from their guts. They're not just from uh, their hearts too. They, there are some hard hitting questions. So I guess what would be the difference between this book and say other ones who, that try, that try to tell parents how to keep their kids Catholic while they're in college, you know what, you get what I'm getting at? Yes, I do. How would yeah. Differ? And, uh, well, it's, well, well, here's the thing. It, it's geared for the student, not for the parent. This is this is for students and you know campus ministers too. I would say uh, you know to be able to flip through, uh, and, and and provide students with solid answers. But but this is not um, th this is not like a mandate. There's nothing like okay, you, you know, you better go to school and re remain Catholic or else. Like this mm -hmm. is geared toward okay, you know what? I'm in a situation at school. I mean, like, is it? Is it okay to underage drink? Is it okay to use marijuana? I mean, these are questions that are, that are in the book, you know. Uh, so, so, you know, you know, a parent saying saying to their kid, you know, don't drink at school, don't or don't underage drink, don't don't do uh, marijuana, don't do illegal drugs. It, it's not coming from that angle. It's coming from okay, 
why why shouldn't I do this? Is it sinful? Is it this? Uh, you know, how do I remain pro life? How do I, um, you know, what, what's the deal with the death penalty? We see so much going on. There's so the, these are questions that come from their perspective, not from the parental perspective of okay. I want you to remain Catholic, and here's here's a great book for you to you know to walk away to school with. Now, no, this is like pick it up for you know. I got a question, and it's not another catechism. This is not another mm-hmm. educational resource. Does it have church teaching in it? Yes. Is, is it faithful to the magisterium? Yes. But I I also was intentional about including personal stories, personal witness in in this book, so it's not just. And then, you know what, let me throw another question. <laughs> let me throw another, you know, catechism at you. We've already got a great catechism. Let's, let's build upon it, make it relational uh, so that kids can relate to this. Yeah. And what I really enjoyed about your book is just the, que- it's the questions coming from them themselves. It, it, it's not from like myself, a 41 year old guy in Tucson, Arizona. It's the, it's a kid on the college campus. So that's what I really like about it. And like you, and what was the process of condensing all of the answers to their questions into the book? Because you didn't go, I mean, you're not writing 100 pages on each question. You're no. you're really condensing it, and you're getting the core teaching out. So what, what was that probably? Like? Uh, that was a fun process. It was a long process, uh, and uh, certainly we we sought some great priests to help us uh, with with making sure that things were, you know, within the teaching of the church and, you know, aligned with the magisterium of the church. Um, but, but I think as authors, we were all surprised and kind of what we did was we met monthly. We said, okay, we're going to work on this section. You're going to work on this section. You're going to work on this section and just kind of clean things up in the Google document, make it look, um, you know, like a book. And as we came back together, we would say, Oh, you know what? This was so insightful. I think I want to, you know, rephrase this or use this in a different way here. I want to think, you know, use this here and I want to use that, you know, language there. And so it it wasn't just a, you know, again, a cut and dry process. This was very conversational. And let me tell you, there were there were disagreements too. <laughs> uh and and that's a beautiful thing. You know, I think oftentimes in our society we have this, you know, this thing like, okay, you can't disagree with me. Well, there was plenty of disagreement um, throughout this. There were a few questions in there that were like, oh, you know what? I have a different perspective on this and you have a different perspective on this. So now w- w- let's, let's go examine, you know, uh, and, you know, and take this to somebody with fresh eyes and, and breathe new perspective into it. And so that's what I think the power of this book is uh, because it's not, because it's because it's not just um, something it, it, it's visceral. There's not just something that's you know a, a, another dry catechism. So yeah, I, I I think that's what makes it so um, so so appealing to college students because we wanted to target them. We didn't want to target you know um, you know their parents. <laughs> right. All right, and Bill, like I said before we went live, you a couple things that you have in your book. So you ready for a? Couple- Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. I'm happy to I'm happy to talk with, with you about them. All right. All right. So let's talk about interpreting scripture. This is the first one in the book. And I hear this one a lot from even high schoolers. So the question is since the magisterium is made up of humans who we know are fallible by nature, how can we know that they are not, even if unintentionally misguiding the community of faith with possible misinterpretations? that may falsely claim to be guided by the Holy Spirit. What does the process look like of accepting dogma as dogma? It's kind of a, yeah. a big question. It <laughs> is. Uh, and that's the reason why we put it first in the book, because uh, I, I, as I say in there, you know, it really is foundational to understanding and, and believing everything else we write. If, if the church is what it says it is. And Jesus says, you know, this is this is the church that's built on Peter's rock that isn't going to fade away, then um then we got to prove that. And so and we've got to stick up for that. So uh, that's the reason why we put it first in the book, but uh, to answer the question, I I would just point to and I do in the book as well, but I would point to the the fact that this church has been around for over 2 thousand years 
Mm -hmm. There is no other institution on the face of the planet that does what the Catholic Church does. By the way, it feeds, educates, clothes more people on the planet than any other organization does and has been doing that Amen. for such a long time, right? That that proves, and you know, also through all the different storms and scandals, we think we live in a scandalous time maybe, but there were times in the church where, you know, when we don't have to go into them that were a lot more scandalous there, than, than this, we have had uh, you know, people having three different popes or arguing about which pope was really pope in in our church's history. And guess what? The church is still standing. the The authentic teachings of the church still st still stand. So I, I would say uh, that right there uh, points to the the the, ex the the mere fact that this is not driven by men because anything driven by men is just going to fail. <laughs> you know, driven by the Holy Spirit, it remains standing. Um, and, and just, and look, despite people trying to undermine the church, it has never, ever, ever failed. Uh, so that is that the other thing I'll quickly add about dogma, which I thought was a very interesting question. I remember I was at a talk by, uh, Mark Shea, uh, he was sitting at Marytown actually. And, and, and he said this about dogma. He said, um, dogma is like the completion of a thought. Once you know two plus two equals four you don't need to think about it anymore you've com you've completed that knowing and and you just know it to be true and so th I, I i think when you look at dogma and understanding that as guess what these are the basics this is the very foundation of what we believe it's two plus two equals four um and nothing else can can grow from it unless we believe these things, then, then I think, man, uh, that lends itself to really understanding what dog, why we should accept dogma, um, you know, of the church. And it's just the foundations and we know it to be true. And then we also don't have to waste a lot of time thinking about it anymore. We, you know, we know it is true and we just believe it. In the group of college students that you worked with, was this a question that they all had, or was it just maybe one or two? I would say one or two of them had this question, um, but it was but it was a good question, and I think when we were talking about it and debating and debating it, uh, really walking with them through it, it was um, it, it was interesting to you know hear hear their response. It was interesting to hear, oh, okay, now I get it, and and see that light bulb go off. <laughs> That's the cool thing, you know, watching those light bulbs go off. Right. So let's go ahead and get to another one. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I had this one when I was in the military, and my son asked me this one, even though he's only in middle school. So I'm going to ask it here. So how can I keep the Lord's Day holy as a college student? Sunday is usually prime time for cramming. Is that sinful? Uh, yes, it is sinful uh, <laughs> to uh, you know spend your entire day cramming, uh, is what I would say. Yes. Uh, and I, I used to, this is a good question because I also use my personal example in this uh, question. I, I was blessed to go to the University of Scranton, which is a Catholic university uh, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And um, my, my campus had Sunday evening masses. So they had a 7 p.m. and they had a 9 p.m. mass on Sunday evenings. Uh, it's pretty hard to miss mass when, you know, because you were out, you know, maybe hanging out a little too late. You can definitely make the 9 p.m. mass. Uh, so more often than not, when I was in school, I, I went to mass because the times were, you know, uh, amenable, but also because, um, you know, I, I knew that it was sinful to miss mass. And so with that being said, I, I would just challenge people who might be thinking, oh, um, I don't need to go to church this Sunday to, to, to say, you know, is your reason for missing mass, a grave reason, right? Like, is it a grave reason? Is it, or, or is it something under the, under the point where like, okay, are, are you going to have to, um, take care of somebody else, you know, or whatever, whatever those things that the church says it's okay to do to miss mass. If it doesn't fall in those categories, if it doesn't fall in grave matter or taking care of elderly or sick people that, you know, that as a caregiver, then you really ought to be at mass. And here's here's the thing that I found interesting when I was researching this question. I I looked at the catechism, and and it mentioned that what we should do. And I don't have the quote right in front of me, but 
but but it's what we should do if we miss mass is to gather as a family or groups of families for an extended period of time and worship God. <laughs> so it, if you're not doing that, that that doesn't really meet the criteria. Like, like it doesn't meet the criteria for worshiping God and giving him, you know, prominence on the day of the Lord's Sabbath, which he asked us to do. So um, I, I would just challenge people that thinking about missing mass, um, you know, to, to uh, evaluate your circumstances. I don't think cramming for your next midterm qualifies as grave matter. Um, uh, but I'll leave that up to you to decide whether you, <laughs> you consider that grave matter or not. <laughs> no, Bill, you made, you made an important point, though, when you started answering the question, when you used your personal example, how you talked about how there was all these masses going all the way up to 9 p.m. Really, God's only asking for an hour. I mean, we can go Saturday night even, I mean, whatever the case is. There's really... The church is the church gives us so many options that we really have to try hard not to go. <laughs> yeah. So there's really no really it like I said, really there's really no excuse with, with so many options that the church gives us. Oh, I agree. Now this this next question, Bill, I want to ask this one because it's still one that it's one I see in you know Protestant Catholic debate groups as well. So it's not I don't think it's just a college student thing. But how should I respond when someone says they're not Christian or Catholic because of quote unquote all the rules? <laughs> uh, I answered this one so shortly in the book, and um, and you know I said this uh, very very simply. I said, ask them what rules. Ask them what rules they are referring to, because I and look I don't mean to be blunt, but here's the thing: oftentimes. They're making up the rules, and they're and they're thinking about something that really is not the rules of of the church. And so, if you can call them out on that, and here's the thing: you don't even have to know that 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 is you know you don't have to be like the most well versed person either, right? I I can just say, let's research this together, right? Like 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 you know, I think a lot of college students are afraid that. That when they say, uh, what rules are you referring to? Well, okay, the rule against, um, you know, not consecrating pickles. That's the reason why we're not allowed to, you know, that's the reason why I'm not becoming. And then you have to go and define that reason why we only consecrate unleavened bread. Like, like let's, let's research it together. You don't have to know exactly the reason why we only use unleavened bread at mass. Like, like let's just go in and research it to, together. But, but ask them what rules they're referring to. Because oftentimes... It's something bogus, <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was fighting coming into the church, and I I used that one time, and like you said, I kind of made up my own thing. Uh, I I forget it was something ludicrous. I can't even remember. I think I blocked it from memory just because it's too painful for me to remember. But <laughs> but, but so I'm gonna, I was, I'm gonna ask one more, and then we'll um, one more question that you have in the book, and then we'll talk about a couple other things about the book. And this is a very powerful question, and I think one that a lot of people ask. Why does God let bad things happen in our world? Yeah, and you know, I um, I was really so struck by this question. Originally, when it was put in uh, the book, it, it said, because um, we were going through the pandemic, and I wanted to extend the life of the book just a little bit beyond the pandemic, and it said, you know, why, does, why did God allow the... Uh, coronavirus to happen, you know, and this bad thing to happen. And, and I said, well, I, I went back the next week and I talked to the kids and I said, well, are you talking about just the coronavirus or are you talking about ba other bad things? Like, like, why does, what is the problem of evil here? And, right. and so, um, they said, of course, yeah, it's not just the coronavirus pandemic. Um, uh, and so when, when I, when I talked to them about this, I said, you know, it really comes down to love. And, and, and I, and I know that that sounds super silly <laughs> that, that this is all about love, but it really is. And, and here's why, because God had to create us with free will to love him or otherwise love wouldn't exist. Like, like if we didn't have the choice to love God or not love God, love could not exist because you can't force somebody to love you. 
right? I mean, everyone understands that. Like in college, like you, right, you're sitting there, you're going, oh, you know, does this, yeah, I, I want to date this girl. Do they love me? Don't they love me? Like all that kind of stuff, right? So God can't force somebody to, to love you. Now, here's the crazy thing. Once you say, no, God, I don't love you, like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of uh, Garden of Eden, like they, you know, they said, God, we don't, you know, you know, we're, re we're rejecting you. We're not going to follow you anymore. Mm -hmm. well, here's, here's the wild thing about that. God said before that to them that they had dominion over all the creatures in, in the garden, all the created name. God gave it to them and said, take care of it. And when, when we, or when Adam and Eve rebelled and said, uh, we're not going to do that anymore. They they abandoned their duty to to that you know to that stewardship, and so therefore creation, all of the rest of creation, you know, follows our lead. Whether that's the weather, whether it's you know dogs biting us, whether it's you know every everything follows that our lead, which was we're rejecting this. So um, why does bad things? Why do bad things happen in the world? It, it's because of us, and and it's because of sin. From a from a global perspective, from 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 a high perspective, um, it's because of you know corporate sin, um, but but to to also give people some hope, you know the the reality is is that we also probably don't know um, you know one hundred percent the drama that God is creating through this battle between sin and and um, and 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 virtue, so. It, it, it really is a wonderful thing um, to take some time and reflect on your own life and say, you know, if all these bad things keep happening, bad, 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 bad in my own life, like if they all just keep happening, is, is it because I am being called to be, go deeper with God and become holier and, and, and get closer to God and rid myself of sin? Mm. And and it doesn't mean that your life is going to be perfect after after you become holier. But what it means, I think, is you're going to see the through the lens of of God's eyes a little more, and and realize, oh, you know what? Let me help in this situation. Let me let, let me become a helper, versus you know somebody who is destroying. Um, so uh, you know that's that was my goal was to you know not only give them a personal perspective, uh, you know, like okay. This is through us, but also to let them know, yeah, it's it really is through the fact that we re rejected God that that these things do happen, and no answer if that's a little lacking, no answer is going to you know satisfy us until we get to heaven and God goes, hey, this is exactly the reason why I did what I did. <laughs> you know, uh, none of us right. get that right answer. So, what kind of the book, book's only been out months at this point, but how what feedback have you received so far? Um, you know, I have been blessed to get some awesome feedback about the book. Uh, first of all, I thank you for writing an amazing review of it on, on your website. My pleasure. Uh, uh, so, so if uh, you're looking for a great review, you head over to, of course, WilliamHemsworth.com and check that out. But, um, I, but, but a few other people as well have uh, written reviews for it and just reached out. Uh, I was at the Catholic Marketing Network um, this past uh, month here, and talking with um, a whole bunch of different people about it. And I had had a couple of people come up to me and say, oh man, this book is so necessary. We need this out there in the church. Uh, I had I had one uh, gentleman who came up to me uh, in, in regards to his neighbor. Uh, his, his neighbor kid was going off to University of Illinois, uh, in, which is a secular university. He's like, oh man, I just have to, I have to give him this. I have to give him a copy of this book because he's going from a private Catholic school to the University of Illinois, and uh, there's just so many challenges. I just got to give them the book. Right. Uh, so, so I think a lot of a lot of that kind of feedback um, about about just you know that that this is a necessary uh, b book for our times, uh, which I mean, God God's timing is always perfect. So, uh, you know, th this is when it was supposed to come out, not in 2012 when I wrote the, when I wrote the foreword. <laughs> <laughs> Well, God's providence is amazing. So <laughs> when it works out, it works out. So where can our listeners get the book? Well, um, where, where can they check it out? Yeah, so the easiest place uh, to do it is right on our website. If you go to patchworkheart.org, uh, you will uh, find the link on our 
uh, online store tab. You head over to the online store. It'll pop up on the main page for you. You'll see the book cover that says Hearts Burning Within Us uh, there. So you can get a copy of the book um, and and just, uh, you know, it's 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 pretty reasonable. I'll just say it's uh, $15, um, you know, to purchase it right, right off our website. And then there are bulk discounts already built into the website. So if you so if you do purchase uh, more than one copy, there's there's bulk discounts built in for you, so that uh, you can do this in small groups or whatever you want to do. If you're a campus minister, if you're uh, you know a, a college or whatever, we can we can work on uh, even furthering those discounts for you. But uh, but it's already built in for like small discounts. Yeah. So go to the description. The link to the book is in the description. So just click, follow, check out. Um, I think you really you really enjoy it. Like I said, like Bill said, it's built for those college students. Uh, Bill, um, great, great work here. Again, the book is Hearts Burning Within Us. And thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. William, it's always great to be with you. Thanks for doing this live. It was uh, awesome to be live on YouTube with you, man. Uh, take care. Yeah, bye now. Come on. There we go.